Mr. President, brothers and sisters, 10 December every year, Sweden Academy and Karolinska Institute give Nobel Prize. And when they have a Nobel Prize ceremony in City Hall and they have dinner, young students say before these people uh, who has got Nobel Prize must give a speech. So um, this um, young student say very seriously, I have great honor to introduce next speaker. And because I'm from Sweden, I will say the same. I have great honor to introduce next speaker, Michael Combs. It's um, 30 years ago I met him here at Ariar. He was making research in Ariar Library and I was studying School of Wisdom. 30 years ago, uh, 1984, this time we was very young, but we are still young, not old. <laughs> Michael Combs is uh, director of Emily Sellion's Memorial Library in New York City. Uh, maybe you English, uh, he is very well known speaker in all, uh, all the world in these uh, speaking countries. But even uh, in uh, Europe, many countries, he is very known. If you have not met him, uh, you have seen his name in many, many magazines. <coughs> he is also author a number of books, articles, and monographs on 19th century theosophy. He has spent a great part of his life researching the world of Blavatsky. Over the last 40 years, his work has taken him through libraries and archives in Canada, England, India, and United States. He has also produced <coughs> abridgment of uh, Blavatsky's two seminal works, Isis and Weld, and Secret Doctrines. Michael Combs is, <coughs> is the recipient of the Hermann Ossubel's Memorial Prize. Maybe you, nobody knows his <laughs> Hermann Ossubel. But he has um, received his uh, memory applies for achievement in history from Columbia University in New York City. He has spent also all, uh, many years uh, going through the archives here at ADR Library, and he has put his uh, finding into his book the doing of the Theosophical Movement, 1987. 2000 and 2007, he was invited to give Blavatsky lecture in England. He has also edited uh, a number of Blavatsky's um, work. And his um, subject, uh, this public lecture, is very important one. Upon this foundation is wisdom established. So now I will ask Michael to give his lecture. Let me introduce 
the speaker who introduced me. His name is Perti Spex. He is the General Secretary of Sweden. I have a few announcements to make before we start. I have been asked to bring you greetings from the New York Theosophical Society, where Theosophy has had a presence since 1875. Can I, can I take your greetings back to New York? What is that? A two yeses over here and a no over here. Can I take your greetings back to New York? <laughs> well, I, after that I may not have to. They probably heard it in New York. The second thing I'd like to mention is I would like us all to have a moment of a re remembrance for our speaker yesterday who was on this platform. That young woman truly embodied a brave declaration of principles. Knowing how ill she was, she came on and she gave her all till she could not stand anymore. It was a great effort of will. So let us send our good thoughts and hearty wishes to Mrs. Linda Oliveri. May she be with us again soon. And the third thing I'd like to do is just suggest to you how to listen to a theosophical lecture. Most people in any theosophical lecture there comes a point where you struggle to keep awake. You fight it and fight it, but you eventually fall asleep. <laughs> My suggestion to you is go to sleep right away. <laughs> because the speaker will probably sum up at the end and you will wake up refreshed, unlike those people who have struggled and struggled and missed the whole thing. Some years ago, when I gave a lecture at the headquarters of the Theosophical Society in London, there was an elderly lady sitting in the first row. They have a beautiful hall there. She immediately went to sleep as I started speaking and was only woken up by the applause at the end. Afterwards, she came up to me and said, this is one of the best talks I heard in this hall. So many people have slept through some of my best talks, so there is no shame in that. So the title of this talk is, Upon This Foundation is Wisdom Established. And it was suggested to me by my reading because soon after her election as international president of the Theosophical Society in 1907, Annie Besant came to the city of Chicago in America and gave a series of lectures. And was the t as was the case at the time, there were a number of questions afterwards and I'll read you this particular question. She was asked, how did she account for the slow growth of the Theosophical Society in numbers? And this is her response. It's very telling, so I quote it in full. She said, you cannot measure the growth of a society merely by the number of people that come into it, but by the spread of the ideas for which it stands. Now compare the world of 1875 with the world of thought today in regard to all religious, intellectual, and scientific questions, and you will find that a great revolution has taken place. The ideas that in 1875 were thought absurd and ridiculous are now becoming commonplace amongst all well-informed people. The growth of theosophy, and that to me is 
the most important part of our work is very great. Its ideas are spreading everywhere and are being echoed everywhere. And this was 1907. How far we have come since that time. Let me just go over that again. That you cannot measure the growth of a society by the number of people that come into it, but by the spread of the ideas for which it stands. So I would like to spend the time allotted to me looking at the spread of those ideas. The history of our society falls into six wonderful stages, each of a 25-year period. Of course, there is that foundation period from 1875 to 1900. And how much has the world changed since then? When that little group that met in New York and formed this organization sowed the germ of what would become a worldwide movement. During that time, global empires have crumbled. Modes of existence that were once tolerated are no longer tolerated. India, the jewel of the crown, once ruled by occupiers, the largest democracy in the world. Universal suffrage, the right of women to vote, once ridiculed, now seen as a universal right. Situations such as apartheid, now seen as a festering sore on the body politic. Yes, how much has changed since that germ? It was not easy for them. A handful of men and women, they started the society, attendance was low. Colonel Olcott, our president founder, paid for the rental of the hall out of his own pocket. Membership attendance declined. They met at their apartments. Colonel Olcott writes that he could not, they could not even find a third person to form a quorum to conduct the society's business. In turn, they deputed the chandelier as that third person. And he says that when they left India, his last deed was to bade, bade goodbye to the chandelier that was one of their most faith, faithful attendees. You know the rest of the story. They're coming to India. His first act when he got off that ship, touching the ground, he was on sacred soil. Let me tell you though, in the 1870s, people in the West would not have come to India for spirituality. India was a place you sent missionaries to not a place you went to learn from. But Olcott and HPB saw something different. There's a wonderful line that N. Sri Ram used about Annie Besant that I think also signifies their view. This is what he said about Annie Besant's view about India. She saw the ideal behind the actual even when the actual had deteriorated. Isn't that a great line? She saw the ideal behind the actual, even when the actual had deteriorated. The attitudes of the British at that time, as you know, Indian education was considered a great uh, concern. Education was believed to be in English. One of the counselors in London Thomas Macaulay, famous educator, wrote that one single shelf of English literature was worth all the literature of Asia. Who today would even think of that? We have truly changed. Madame Blavatsky's first great book, Isis Unveiled, 
published in 1877, awaken the world to the idea of India as a source of a regenerating spirituality. That here, in this country, in this place, was something unique. As she says about her travels in India, we, we were in India unlike the British who were just surrounded by India. They traveled everywhere. They talked to philosophers, swamis, yogis. Colonel Oka traveled through this country on a bullock cart. Imagine traveling through rural India on a cart that had wooden wheels with no traction. Their devotion was unparalleled because, again, they saw the ideal behind the actual, even when the actual had deteriorated. This was so against the accepted view of the time. One missionary, a Mr. Joseph Cook, who came to India, reported to his congregation in 1882 that if there was any light in Asia, it was a twilight. Yet because of them being established here, starting a magazine here that was sent from India to the West, it changed people's perceptions. They could read not what Westerners wrote about India, but what Indians wrote about their own country and philosophy. C.W.L. has a, C.W. Leadbeater has a wonderful anecdote. He said, we still remember the incitement they would have when the issue of the Theosophists would come bearing that in faint smell of the East and the fact that the ink still came off on your hands. As you know, the publication of The Secret Doctrine in 1888 was what we would call in America a game changer. It really radically introduced a great number of ideas. I don't have to tell you about it. It would be like taking coals to Newcastle, though of course there are no more coals in Newcastle today. This book has celebrated its 125th anniversary, published in all languages, read around the world. It has emerged as one of the great texts of the 19th century, equal to Karl Marx's Das Kapital and Darwin's Origin of Species. When you think of the vast amount of literature that was published in English, how much has survived? Yes, we still know Dickens. We know Jane Austen because she's a woman. But imagine the secret doctrine is still read, still studied. What a great tribute to the validity of the book. I may add a shameless plug for my own edition of the book. I have an abridgment that was published by Penguin if you want a nice road map to the entire book. In fact, as I was coming out of the airport, I saw it in the stall at the bookshop here. But the society's influence did not end there. The next 25 years saw an even further growth an expansion, uh, if you will, with the election of Annie Besant in 1907 as international president, the society widened these concepts. It became involved in education. It had an impact in the arts and, of course, in literature. And let us not forget the role of the Theosophical Society in nurturing the work of J. Krishnamurti, who in turn has emerged as one of the great philosophers of the 19th, the 20th century. The next 25 years, 
1925 to 1950 were very much different years than those great years of expansion. There was such an enthusiasm in those years. A world teacher was going to come. The society was going to be the means of that. But, of course, things changed. As J. Krishnamurti himself pointed out, we had been waiting for someone to tell us how to think, what to do. We had been waiting for someone, and yet, when that person came, we weren't ready for that message. As he himself has said, I did not leave the Theosophical Society. The Theosophical Society left me. And one of the great accomplishments of our previous president, Dr. Radha Bernier, was to bring Krishnaji back to Adyar. As you know, soon after her election, he actually came here, he walked here. There is a tree that is planted by him. But the years after 1925 to 1950 were difficult years, not only for the society, but for the world at large. A global financial depression, a war fought in the East and West. Theosophists adapted. Our society emerged a smaller one, but yet committed to those ideals. So that from 1950 to 1975, it prepared itself for that new impulse. It became a means of generating ideas, nurturing so many other speakers. And though it was a smaller one, again, it was extremely vital. Our platform has been the means for so many other teachers to get their footing, to get their voice. And now, in this new century, in this new age, we face great challenges in this changing world. The main being the digital revolution. India, as you know, has 1.5 billion population. If you live in America like I do, more than likely your doctor is Indian, your lawyer is Indian, your investment banker who is embezzling you is Indian. <laughs> Indians have been the greatest export of this country. India also is the third largest consumer of internet probably only after China and America. If you have a problem with your computers in America and you call for a helpline, you will meet someone who says, Sir, my name is Sam, and they're in Bangalore or here in India telling you how to fix your computer or your cell phone. I make my point. We are more connected than ever before, yet we remain more individually isolated. HPV has pointed out that we are in the Kali Yuga and that its effects are a thousandfold greater in the West. Now, at this point, in my talk, if I was giving it in America or Europe or Australia, I would tell you about the great things that the society has done, that it has pointed out to a ancient spiritual tradition that exists till modern times, that there are things like karma and reincarnation but telling this to an Indian audience, all I might get is, and? <laughs> so, tell us something we don't know. So I will tell you about the horrors of the West, my friends, which I have seen only too well, and which in turn is coming your way. 
Of course, as you know, the great materialism. People have everything and yet they have nothing. Uh, one of my favorite authors, Carson McCullers, wrote about loneliness and American malady. People live together and yet they're so isolated. Antidepressants are the biggest medication supplied in the West, in America. We have everything, yet we have nothing. Did you hear about this? Have you heard about this? It shows you how far things have gone. Two dogs got married in New York at the cost of over $125,000. Two dogs got married. I don't know if they're divorced now, but <laughs> imagine. That alone could fund orphanages, shelters for people, so many things. But my friends, this is this tidal wave that is coming your way. Um, some years ago, I was in Delhi and was invited to tea at the home of someone who worked for the Prime Minister. He had been in charge of the Indian Railways. His daughter was going out in blue jeans to play tennis. All of those things are coming here. This is why it is so important that an organization like the Theosophical Society exists. There are numerous societies in this country, numerous missions, swamis, yogis, but this organization is unique because we have no dogma, no creed. You are free to believe anything, everything, nothing. And yet, all that is asked for you is that we form that nucleus of universal brotherhood, which is so important. We are fortunate because since the founding of the society, there has been numerous translations of texts, philosophies. We don't have to give resumes of other religions, but we can see where all of these various religions, philosophies, enlarge our concepts, validate what we do in theosophy. One of the most interesting finds lately is translations of Tibetan texts about the bardos. You know the Tibetans believe in six bardos. The bardo is the intermediate state. There's the bardo of death. So at the moment of death, you go through a particular state. As Madame Blavatsky pointed out, one has a life review. Not like watching a movie of one's life walking by, but seeing the consequences, seeing the purpose of our actions. There is a state after death, then there is that state before birth. As one is about to come into birth, one sees the purpose of one's life, one sees one's parents. Our karma brings us into a specific time and place. It's so remarkable to think that we choose the form, the place that we in turn are born. There, of course, is the bardo of birth. We all are alive here, except a few of you in the back row. Uh, we are all alive. And then there is the bardo of meditation, the state that is achieved in meditation so much different than our day-to-day -day waking state. And, of course, there is the bardo of sleep. All these things simply tell us that life is a continual succession of states. It is moment by moment living. Why grieve for something that eventually will pass away? We create our unhappiness. We are trying to seize the moment, hold on to it, like water flowing through our hands and yet we want to make it a stagnant pond. 
to hold on to that moment while the urgency of change the possibility of what comes next brings us so much more fulfillment our international president has spoken about this recently in New York there is an excellent video of his on YouTube which I suggest you see most important of all yes our society has given all of these great spiritual ideas but they existed in Asian philosophy most important of all it has brought to the forefront that there are those great spiritual teachers that exist in ancient times that exist till today and are concerned with the welfare of humanity as you well know in her book the voice of the silence the path is shown so simply to live to benefit mankind is the first step can we become more caring more aware of others because there is no other there is only that one reality manifesting itself in wonderful various ways in India we call it Leela it's the play of the divine HPB again likes to give the example of the moon shining on the ocean waves the one thing is there but it just varies we think there is difference but it is not because the divine is unlimited potential and each of us has the chance to live up to that divinity that unlimited potential and when we are there for another person in need we are fulfilling the divinity in each of us the idea of that one initiator that one divine teacher behind all things is truly wonderful they say that these great teachers create a guardian wall around humanity protecting it from even greater harm and evils the voice of the silence gives this wonderful phrase when the pupil finally attains that state attains what in India we would say is the Jivan Mukti attains liberation then Dharma tells us can there be bliss when all that lives must suffer shalt thou be saved and hear the whole world cry the suffering of humanity weighs paramount on those great teachers the individual dramas in our lives are nothing friends today there is some child living in fear there is some mother grieving there is some parent suffering loss when we meet together like this it makes a tremendous unity and harmony when we share ideas as you know one of the great things about these conventions is of course the speakers on the stage I am not speaking of myself in this case but we exchange ideas this is the wonderful thing we meet each other we haven't seen you we talk we exchange we come alive we share we truly live to be human it's no accident that the society's work is so much about social welfare animal welfare that this place exists in the heart of this teeming city is a marvel unto itself HPB gave us an indication of the future she said that every previous attempt at a theosophical society had ended in failure because it had set up hard and fast beliefs and become a dogma it excluded these accepted these but as she said it had lost by imperceptible degrees that 
living vitality that only truth can impart. Where do we find that living vitality? Truly, that only truth can impart. As you know, our late president, in her book, Human Regeneration, ends her last chapter with the, uh, one called The Source of Spiritual Energy. She points out that each of us has that potential, that source of spiritual energy, and all that remains for us is to tap it, to unleash that ability. And that ability comes not only for our own growth, our own understanding, but for our ability to share, to meet, to greet. Our older students, like CWL, would have said clairvoyantly when we meet, the great devas are here with us. There is an outpouring of force. Can't you feel that? Can you feel that? No, you can't? Is that a, is that a no? You can't feel it? Okay, well, I feel it. So, theosophy endures in this world of constant change. And our movement still has something unique, something special to offer. And it is up to each of us as members of this society to become active co-workers with truth. That truth that supplies, supplies stability, harmony, that peace, that passes understanding. The question is, are we as members up to this challenge? For we must, if we are, if we are to remain relevant to the dialogue today, we must rise up for our complacency Active workers are needed. Anyone who works in the Theosophical Society knows that immediately thought of self is pushed away because there is so much to do for this organization. Your being here, your coming, some of you from miles, many countries, is a testament to that commitment, to that wonderful greeting. Now, uh, as with these talks, they tend to go on for an hour. But you may have noticed that after the talks, the different groups meet and then go and discuss the ideas in their regional languages. We see that after every talk. So I am going to kind of wrap up and let your groups go and interpret what I've said. But before I do that, I would like to thank our international president for having me here. We have known so many great people on these grounds who have sanctified our lives, who have inspired us, who still exist in our hearts. You know the story in the Ramayana at the end of the Great War when the battle is over and Hanuman is to be sent away. He asks to stay and he rips open his heart and there at the center of devotion is Sita and Rama. At the center of our being is that devotion to this cause of truth. We are all, it is a thankless task to work for the Theosophical Society. As Colonel Olcott remarked to a younger member, the philanthropist lot is not an easy one. Few can wear that crown of thorns that it gives. He said that the initials PTS stood not only for president of the Theosophical Society, but pariah of the Theosophical Society, for it brings you only criticism. Yet these great ones have endured as our teachers have pointed out about their critics, they are like snakes hissing at the Himalayas. It's a great image, isn't it? So, 
It's wonderful to see you. It's wonderful to hear you here. I would like us just to end with uh, some words to the great teacher. There's, Sanskrit is such a wonderful language. And unfortunately, my Sanskrit or even my Hindi is pathetic. Uh, I was once in Benares and I wanted to ask about getting bread and instead of saying Ora kaha milti hai, I wanted to say Oroti kaha milti hai. It came out Ora kaha milti hai. And the man said, what, what, do you know what you're saying? I said, I want to get bread. Instead I was asking, where do I get woman? <laughs> so instead of saying Oroti kaha milti hai, it came out all that kaha milti uh, I was, you know, in New York we have a large Indian population. And I saw an Indian chap cutting a large piece of cheese. So I thought I'd be clever and I said, Vo cheese kya hai? He said, cheese, cheese hai. <laughs> Which I thought is great. So my Sanskrit would probably. Uh, bring disfavor to the gods above. So I will ask my bitter half, my better half, Kumari Jayshree, to come and just perhaps give us a chant from that beautiful shloka to the great teacher Dakshinamurti to bless us all. She had chanted this beautiful shloka to me and I really wanted to share it to you because it really is an intense mantra and so beautiful. So. <coughs> I'm going to sing three paragraphs of on Dakshina Murti. It is strange to see the very old disciples and the very young teacher who sits under a banyan tree with the teacher always observing silence and the students getting all the doubts clear. Salutations to that Dakshina Murti, who is the teacher of the entire world, who is the doctor to those afflicted by the disease of birth and death, and who is the treasure house of all knowledge. Salutations to that Dakshina Murti, who is the meaning of the Pranava Om, who is the personification of uh, unalloyed wisdom, who is crystal clear in his thought, and who is the epitome of peace. Mm. Aho vatat dor mule vridha sishya guru ryuva guru stu maunam yakyanam sishya stu Chinna samsaya Gurave sarva lokanam Vishaje bhavaroginam Nidaye sarva vidyanam Shri Dakshina Murtaye Nama Om Nama Pranavarthaya Shuddha Jnani Kamu
ಮೂರ್ತ ನಿರ್ಮಲಾಯ ಪ್ರಶಾಂತ ದಕ್ಷಿಣ ಮೂರ್ತ ನಮಃ ನಮ ಪ್ರಣವಾ ಶುದ್ಧ ಜ್ಞಾನೈಕಮೂರ್ತ ನಿರ್ಮಲ ಪ್ರಶಾಂತ ದಕ್ಷಿಣ ಮೂರ್ತ ದಕ್ಷಿಣ ಮೂರ್ತ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ವೆರಿ ಮಚ್ ಮೈಕ್ ಇಟ್ ವಾಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಇನ್ಸ್ಪೈರಿಂಗ್ ಲೆಕ್ಚರ್ what uh, linda spoke yesterday about uh, to change transformation and uh, all this knowledge what we are going to hear during this week and what we have heard <coughs> we should uh, all knowledge what we have we should integrate with consciousness and not with memory that real transformation is possible <coughs> uh, michael uh, speech gave many many um, ideas um, to think and uh, remember <coughs> and uh, if you have uh, something uh, to take up so you know that you can write questions and uh, and give to maria maria artama <coughs> So this uh, section is over now. Thank you. Tears. Oh, she's sweet. <laughs> <laughs>